of what we're doing is always come back, coming back to gradual release and the teaching piece. Kim talked about this. Deb talked about this. This has come through in everything, but I, we can't not have it um, first and foremost in our minds at all times. First, I model. Whatever it is I want kids to do, I model it. Okay? And then I have to provide guided practice, okay? which is a chance for us to do it together okay? with whatever it is that I want them to learn. Because we're still there as a coach, a very deliberate coach. We're walking side by side, hand in hand, as we have the guided practice. And sometimes I'm the coach as the teacher, and sometimes the guided practice is set up so that we're working in partners. But you never get sent to do something on your own until you've had a chance to practice. Okay? In anything that we do, in literacy, in anything that we do, in any of the stuff that's going on in school. Okay? We're doing it together before we're launched out on our own. And when we're launched out on our, on our own, it becomes an independent practice. But I'm still there, I'm just a step away in case some help is needed. Okay? But you're getting to try and do it by yourself because if I stay side by side with you forever, you won't get to the independent piece. Okay? That's as true in self-regulation as it is in figuring out which page to open the book on. Okay. What I'm looking for, um, and we've talked about that observation and collecting evidence of kids' learning, what I'm looking for is when kids are doing this, whatever I've been teaching them, on their own. Okay? So if I, when I've been reading, in say in a shared read aloud, I've started... Um, as Kim did with us today when she read us Pete the Cat. She looked at the cover. She had a little chit-chat about it. She thought about what was going to be inside. So I've done that in my modeling. I might say to the kids when they're working with their buddies and they're reading on the carpet and they've got a partner and they're reading, remember, check out your book and talk about the cover before you go. And then I might say to them, and, um, what did you notice when you looked at the cover? Because they might need a little bit of extra help in getting started and looking at the cover. And then if I notice that I've still got somebody like Phil who's, you know, thinking that maybe he'll look at the cover tomorrow, I can help him find the cover on his book. And he and his partner together can look at the cover together because that's what support looks like. Okay? But when they're reading without me having said that, I'm watching, I'm doing that scanning piece all the time in the class when they're doing an independent reading, they're coming in, they're picking up a book. Do they pick it up and look at it before they start or do they just fling it open? So that I can stop and say, you know, what did you notice that you did when you first started today and how did it help you? Okay? That's all part. So it's just, it just infuses everything that we're doing so that it becomes explicit to the kids what the behaviors need to look like. Now, if we do that, um, there's a couple of, this is another one of those frameworks. It's kind of a dancing part through frameworks that we know well. It's coming from the assessment for learning research. It's those same three descriptive um, feedback questions, what's working, what's not, what's next. I have them in my head all the time with my class as a whole, with my small groups, with my individuals, and I'm talking deliberately about them, and I'm labeling those questions as I say them in different ways, so that when the kids are working in small groups and together, they're using the same questions, and that we're working as we come and we're working together and somebody's reading to me and I say to them, how's this book going for you? You know, how are you doing on it? What's working? What are you having no trouble with? Is there something in here that's a bit of a challenge? How can I help? That's a very different setup for a student than them just waiting until the avenging angel comes by and provides help. Because then there's too much off task time because you can't get around to all 20 of them at the same time. And so, and you get really good at masking behavior, so it's hard to find who are you going to go next. You need that piece. It's that, it's the agency piece again. But getting it so that it's inside the child's head, so that they're saying to themselves, I got this. I think maybe I didn't get this part so much. And when somebody, when I get a chance to get some help, I know the kind of question I want to ask. Okay? So again, it's, that, it's a big picture that we have in our head that we're thinking about all the time. Because if we're going to improve their performance as readers, then we have to have some of those big frameworks that just influence the way we talk and interact with the kids. So the other piece that we wanted to, when Randy and I were talking about what this would look like, the other piece that 
we were thinking about in terms of the, um, the research and some of the big ideas around what makes a difference, what makes the most difference in supporting literacy with all students, was thinking about, so you know, what does it look like? What's, what are some of the choices that make a difference during the day for the range of learners who are in the classroom? And so what we're going to do in this next piece is, is I'm going to just explain a little bit about what this daily menu looks like, and then we're going to try and show you some samples of what some of these pieces look like. Um, and we're just going to kind of bounce back and forth on that a little bit. And Randy is going to wear his special ed hat. He's the support person. And so when he jumps in from time to time, this is the kind of thing that he could be doing with me in the classroom. Um, focused on goals that we have for our kids. But we'll sort of unpack that as we're going. But I just always think that it's good to have a few of those what does it look like in the classroom pieces <coughs> when you're going, because you never know when somebody's going to ask you that tricky question, because um, you know, out onto the part that you figured out. So the first thing is, we know the power of read aloud, right? So we're reading aloud all the time during the day, many times little pieces, big pieces, different kinds of text. I'm going to skip modeling the read aloud piece because Kim modeled read aloud with us very nicely with Pete the cat. And did you hear, were you listening with your outside voice when she said, I'm going to read a book to you? The groom went, ah. You know, we're the grown ups and we still went, ah, someone's finally going to read us a book. Um, so it's that same feeling for kids. And we know the power of hearing a fluent, expressive reader read. Now, there's two pieces that I want you to think about in the read aloud piece. There's the time when we're reading. We're sort of grabbing something and reading it. And we're just reading through. We're not doing a lot of teaching with it. We're just reading through. But it's still, even in a reading through, in my mind, isn't it just start in the first word and go through to the end? Because we do little pieces along the way without dissecting the book and without stopping the flow where we talk about what it looks like as we make meaning. Because if we don't, then Kids can separate the, this is what teaching and working at reading looks like, and this is what reading looks like. So I'm trying to get to the galloping stage, because we're never trying to get to the galloping stage. We're trying to get to the piece where it's always about thoughtful reasoning as we go through. So, and as, as Kim did as she went, she taught, she had little side talks as she went, and it didn't slow, it, slow us down. Again, you know, I'm sitting next to Alan. It's his grandson's favorite book, okay? And guess what? Grandpa knew all the words that were coming next. He predicted along with them. He said, you know, I get to read this book every time I'm with my grandson many, many times because it's his favorite. And even though Alan is a pretty experienced literacy educator, he still was chiming in there. He knew the colors. He knew what was going to match up with the, the thing that had made it the color. Yeah, I was very <laughs> impressed because uh, I was practicing so I would know them too. Um, but that's the piece. You see, it's, the, it's that invitation. Maureen started by saying, this is about not just creating readers who read, but re creating readers who want to read, who do read, and who see reading as a joyful opportunity, as something that's good for them. And so we want to be working with that. If you pick up a book or you're reading something and you're just thinking, oh, ghastly, so boring. Ooh, you know, I can't believe the librarian gave this to me. I guess I should have read it first because uh, it's, you know, that the kids are picking up on that. Okay, you need, you need to have that piece. This is a real thing. It needs to sound like something you want to read. Okay. Now, the next piece I want to think about in here, though, is the think aloud piece. And some of you have heard me do my little think aloud. You know, you, you, we need to be doing think alouds all the time. I think I've been saying this now for several years. I firmly believe if we did a think aloud in every classroom in our province every day for 5, 10, 15 minutes, no matter what kind of text, and with a variety of kind of text, if we did nothing else differently, I think we'd improve reading performance for all kids. It's as simple as that, and it takes not one minute of prep, okay? not a speck of prep. It just takes the consciousness of thinking about, I'm going to do this. Okay? So that's the piece we're going to do next. We're going to model a little think aloud. Randy and I together, because we happen to be both hanging out in the classroom together, uh, working with this group of kids. Um, and so this is one of the ways that the collaboration could look um, as we're going. And we're sitting in this class, just going to get to my right um, spot. In this class, we're going to be in a, 
uh, two, three class. Uh, here's the steps. They're written down. Um, if you haven't done them before, don't worry about the writing down because it actually takes more words on the paper. It's just easier to do it. The first thing we're doing is I'm going to model what my, goes on inside my head when I'm reading this passage. Okay? But I'm doing that with my students in mind because I've been watching them. I've been thinking about who they are, and I've been thinking about what do they need to know. So that's what I'm modeling. That's what I'm putting into my head. Because as one of the teachers said to me well, once, uh, this is um, a young woman, and it was, actually it was two of them. They were cute as buttons and sitting in a workshop when I was doing this. And I noticed they weren't participating very well in this part. And one of them said, well, you know, Faye, I actually didn't have any trouble reading when I was in school, so I never did this part. I said, well, it's not actually about whether or not I'm having trouble reading. It's about what my kids are doing. I'm trying to show them <laughs> what they could do. So it's, you know, it's, not a, it's not a reflection on self. It's a teaching piece. Okay? And it varies depending on who your kids are, right? Because you're thinking about what, is, what do they need to know. Because this is going to be a thread that you can pull out into your small reading groups, that you can pull out into your one-on-one, -on -one, because some of those kids need more practice with it, right? So you start it here, and then you come back. It's also that opportunity to target that child that you pick for your inquiry. Because if I'm the resource teacher or the ABED teacher or the ABED worker or whomever that's working with Faye, the classroom teacher, here's my chance to model something that I know that that child could particularly benefit from. In an integrated way, right? Yes. So it's all together. Okay. So now, I'm going to model, and then I'm going to give them a chance to practice. That's the guided practice. And then we're just going to go on with the reading. Because what I'm trying to do is give those deliberate practicing sessions in the whole group session so that as they get more and more of it, they have better chance of being independent when they go and do their own work. So it doesn't, I'm not doing this for half an hour or 45 minutes. It's faster than that. Okay. We've just finished up that lesson. We're now, oh, great. We're going into our small group reading. Okay? Some of us call it small group reading. Some of us call it guided reading. Some of us follow the guided reading. Uh, Fountas and Pinnell levels very, very carefully. Some of us choose, go into the book room and sort the books into hard, harder, hardest, and then take that hard, harder, hardest, and then separate them out again, like Tony Stead said, and make them hard, harder, hardest until we've got the number of categories that we want to have. I talked to my friend Colleen Reimer the other day, and I said, when you've got somebody who's really, really struggling, what do you think is one of the most important things that you do? And she said, it's book choice. I take the whole little group that the kid's are reading in. We go to the book room. I take out all the books of the little box of books that are sort of around the level that I think we're going to be reading. And I say to the kids, choose two books in here. I sort of do a quick book talk with them. I say, choose two books in here that you think you'd all like to read. Everybody chooses two. Um, and then we vote, and we decide who's going to read what one first. And then we read them as a little group. She said, I do it every time we sort of need a new little collection of books to start with. It takes a few minutes, but every kid has perused every book half a dozen times before we ever get to the part of actually reading, and they all think every book is worth reading because it's been chosen, if not by me, by my partner, by somebody else. Um, and it's all about choice, but it's also about building background knowledge before we get in. So the important part here isn't how strict you are with the leveling. You know, that's, that's, that, these, are, these are personal choice pieces. Um, that's not the most important part. The important part is that kids have a book that works for them at an instructional level, a just right book, because they're going to be in a smaller group and you're going to be deliberately and explicitly teaching them. But this time when you're teaching them, you're also going to remember those whole group lessons that you've been doing so that you can follow along on the same language. Because if what you've been modeling in that with the read aloud with the big book is there, it better show up in the small group practice or it's going to look to kids like they're getting two different sets expectations and models for what is reading. This is what we do in the big group. This is what we do in the little group. And we need the consistency. Okay? So we're going to start, and we're going to do the same thing. But in this group, because this is a really group of, <coughs> a group of young, young readers, um, I'm going to start with my book. And I'm going to just say to them, it's called In Went Mouse. In Went Mouse. Hmm. And there's the cover. So I've got four kids sitting with me, right? In went mouse. Here's the cover. 
what do you think we should do first? We should look at the picture, and what should we do with that picture? Because we did it this morning when we read the sea otter pup. We asked questions about what we wondered about that picture. Okay? So I've done it in the whole group. I'm going to start the same way. Now, I might have decided that what I really wanted to do here was start by telling them a few things about this picture um, or doing a brainstorm around the picture. But if I'm going to do that, then I better not have modeled with the questioning the first thing this morning because I could do that with my kids who are already reading because they've got more strategies under their belt. But my kids who are struggling, they need that same strategy as what I modeled earlier in the day. So they can think, oh, I think she might have done that. Because, you know, it, times, it takes a little more, did we really do that this morning? Yes, we did, and yesterday, and the day before, and we're going to do it for several more days. Because you need that in order to get it inside so you own it, so you're not just waiting and saying, I've got a book, what should I do next? Okay, because that, that's that signal coming through. Okay, so we're going to ask some questions. You know, question, question, question. But you're all gifted, so you already understand that part. But the piece in there that I want to keep coming back to is I'm choosing a way of starting, because it takes lots of repetition, starting it in my big group, and then threading through one or two aspects that I want to reinforce in my small group. And with the, with the more the kids need support, the more consistent it needs to be when I get into this piece. So we've asked some questions. We're also going to picture walk this book before we start, because I know this is an early, early reading book, that really the big idea in this piece is that the kids are getting directionality, that they're thinking about looking at the pictures in order to be able to tell the story, and that they're remembering that a story makes sense. And it's secondary if they can do all the words. That's coming next. First of all, they've got to get that part that this is story. It will make sense. It will go in this direction. We could talk about it when it's done, okay? No matter what the book is, it gets picked up. So we go through, and as we picture walk, as you all know, remember when we picture walk, we go through, and we talk about what's happening in each picture, and we say all the words. We just don't actually read them, okay? So I'm looking through, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I think there's that tree with a big hole in it, and I bet that little mouse that's right there by the picture, I wonder what do you think he's going to do? You think he might go in? I think he did, and if he already had gone in, we'd say that he went in. Oh, I wonder if that little mouse is going to go in that tree, and then we could say that he went in the tree. In went mouse. Hmm. And I wonder what might be happening here. What kind of animal do you think this one might be? And I wonder what he might be doing. I wonder if he's doing the same thing. He's trying to get into that hole in the tree he's already in. So I could say that he went in the hole in the tree. And I think he's probably an owl. And I do the same thing as I go through, right? Woodpecker, blah, 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 blah. OK. <laughs> so then we all pick up, because we've all got our own little pieces. And then they all start to read back to me. We might read it all together putting our fingers on the words as we go through. Let's read it together once. Three words. The first one says, in went mouse. And we'd all do it together. And the next one goes, in went owl. I can't believe how smart you are. You knew all those words as we were going. Look at that. How cool is that? In went woodpecker. OK. So Randy, now you and I are going to um, talk for a moment. So we've done this together, right? We're sort of removing the supports. And now I'm going to read with each one of them. OK? But I'm going to let Randy do this piece. So you can be the first person reading. So he's now going to, Randy's going to be the person reading and the teacher responding. First, though, in your brain, you might have been doing, so why would the outside the classroom person be standing in the classroom while the classroom teacher is doing all this? Now, if what I want to do is come back to the context of that classroom, whether I'm doing pullout or whether I'm doing a small group over there while Faye's doing a small group over here, I need to know about the context of that classroom. I need to know what she's modeling and doing with her class so that I can reinforce that. I need to be connected to what she's doing. So there may be times, yes, when I feel like I'm standing against the wall while the classroom teacher who owns the classroom, because <laughs> whether your brain noticed that part or not, <coughs> A was the classroom teacher and she took the leadership. I am the support person and my role is to support her. 
Now, we may have decided in the co-planning that I was going to take the leadership. We decided to model that it's her classroom. She's going to take the leadership. And I'm going to feed in where I would feed into that. Now, that's going to vary from day to day and time to time. And it might be 15 minutes today and 25 minutes tomorrow and 45 minutes the next day. Because it doesn't have to be every lesson, all lessons. But I so firmly believe that I cannot be the support person working with kids who are getting additional support if I don't know what's going on in her classroom. Oh, good. That was yeah. <laughs> Sometimes when you say things like that, you wonder whether anybody else is going to agree with you in the room, right? <laughs> yes. So, I can go back to now the direct modeling of what we did this morning from the point of view of that whole group lesson that we did. So, in went, okay, that's got to be what that little picture is. Now, I don't know if that word's mouse or not, but... I bet it's got to be you, that picture, because that's what people do when they write books. In went mouse. Hmm. What's the mouse going to find, you think, when he goes into that tree? It's going to be in there. Oh. Maybe the mouse better be pretty scared about going in there. I don't know. You know, like if I was a mouse, I don't know if I... Oh, but I bet he's running away from something. I bet he's running in there and he's safe. Hmm. What do you think, Faye? What do you think that okay. mouse is doing? Okay. See, now what I think is that Randy's mom read him a whole bunch of books before he came to school because <laughs> he's looking at this and he's got story, story, story and coming out of this part, right? So, uh, but I'm thinking, and I'm going back to my cueing systems, meaning, structure, visual cues. Has he got meaning? Mm -hmm. Now, did he also get the structure as he went through in went mouse? Like, that's a really sophisticated structure. Our kids, are, uh, most kids that I run into aren't running around saying phrases like in went mouse. It doesn't, you know, come out at, in, very often. Um, and he's also done the checking on the visual. That was the only part that he really stumbled on because he heard that and his, his language sense was strong enough that he could hang on to the in went mouse as he was going through. Now, Randy might have done, so now I'm going to be the reader, and I might have come through and said, in goad mouse. Okay. And so what does Randy notice as the teacher when I read it, in goad mouse, and then I read the next page, in goad owl, in goad wo woodpecker? Why am I doing that? Because that's the way I talk. And that's, your meaning. And that's my meaning. And so I need to decide as the teacher whether or not it's important enough to correct that. Because if I'm going back to meaning first, then that's my big idea in these early books, then I might just say, I might say out loud, you're right, in went mouse. Because he needs to hear the language before he can read it differently. But to stop and, and have a little mini word lesson on the difference between goat and went is going to make absolutely no difference to the student. So it's that timing piece. Right. And the three that don't need it, that's right. And the three that don't need it are waiting while I'm going through in the goat. And the message is correct, 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 rather than move forward. Okay. Now, the other piece that could have happened here is that it could have been an in went a really tiny little mouse. Okay, a really tiny little mouse. And so Randy might decide as the teacher that I'm at a stage where he could say to me, because he's, been, he's only working with four of us, right? So he's got lots and lots of time to give very direct. He's only giving me one thing to work on next, right? He might say, wow, you totally got the meaning of that. And it is a really tiny mouse. And he did go into the tree. Let's put our finger on the words and see how many words were here. In went, and in your head you're thinking, a little tiny because you're wishing the person had written that because they clearly needed to. It's a little mouse. Mouse. Okay? Let's do it together. In went mouse. Okay? So you've got that same structure in your head. You're thinking of meaning, structure of language, visual cues. And because it's a one-on-one -on -one and you've only got a group of four, you can give that individualized piece as they're going through. Okay? Do you want to say something else? No. no. Okay. So you get the picture in there, but notice that we're only choosing one thing. I'm choosing one, maybe two things from my whole group lesson that comes through into my guided reading lesson. And then in my guided reading lesson, as I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, I'm being really deliberate about what that child needs to move forward. Okay? And I'm trying to resist the urge to do the same thing 
just because the four of them are together, because it's back to that piece again. What you need is different than the person beside you, because I'm trying to recognize and honor the piece that you've done and nudge you a tiny bit forward. Okay? Each time as we go through. And Randy is, I, remember it's my classroom. I've got these kids all day long. When he's in there helping me, it has to be helpful. Okay? Not the humming radiator. How can I help today? Well, if I have to stop and teach you how to help me before we begin, I've actually now upped my uh, number of students in the class, which is not all that helpful. And they are paying you. I want you to have a job and know what to do when you get here. So we need to have, so he's right, that watching piece. But he's not watching for half an hour. He's participating, and he's doing the scan the whole time he's there. What? Because wh he's going to see things that I won't see because I'm running it right now. So then he can figure out who to pick up on as he does his next piece. It's a dance, okay? It's a dance as we're coming through. Now, just before we move to the next piece or give you a tiny piece, that um, In Went Mouse is from a new collection of books that Core Learning Resources was, has been putting together. Um, now, does it say, yes, it says, they're called Strong Readers, and uh, Terry Mack, who many of you may know, they're all have a First Nations basis, they're beautiful artists, they've just done a lovely job. They've got the first 10 levels done, they'll be out on the 17th of September, and now they're working on the next group of levels. All based, um, in fact, there's even one that stars Laura Tate and her daughter, and there's one that stars Laura Tate's grandmother and her son, which I didn't know, I'd have done that book instead, but I didn't know until I had my <laughs> slides done. So, you know, we're always looking for um, resources for early readers. And this is a beautiful, beautiful um, set of books. Um, remember that it's, uh, they'll come out through core learning, um, core learning resources. This will be on the PowerPoint that Irene is putting up, um, so it'll be easy to access as it's coming through. But just as a little extra piece as they're going. Um, okay, Randy, I'm going to let you talk for just a moment about what else it could look like while the groups are going on, and then I'm going to give us, um, then I think we need to shift to um, coming to a little bit more into the collaboration. Yeah. Whoops. So one of the things Ray and I talked about is that one of the goals of this project is wrapped around collaboration, right? The resource teacher and the classroom teacher working together. And there's nothing worse than feeling like you're, like you're the extra pair of hands or you're standing there twiddling your thumbs or all those sorts of things that are going on. So the key in that is having that trust relationship between two people. Knowing that it's okay to grab the mic out of someone's hand, interrupt, feedback with one another, work together, bounce off one another to do all those sorts of things. When we develop that kind of relationship, we're modeling that for kids from the point of view of how two adults can work together and how they can learn together, we're also so significantly increasing our own skills in how we work. Because if I'm in a classroom watching the classroom teacher participating, I'm learning from that classroom teacher around how she works with, what works, what doesn't work for those kids. The same thing is happening for the classroom teacher when I'm the one who's doing that teaching. And the more that we can do that, the more I'm no longer alone in my profession. And I firmly believe that our profession is one of the most lonely professions on the face of the earth because I'm in my room by myself, and I don't have to be. There's lots of times when I can be with others beyond six, seven, and eight-year-olds. OK. Do you want to talk a little bit through there? And then we'll oh, do the review? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So one of the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore that for a minute. I'll start with Thank one of my key learnings. Lori will remember this woman, Anita DeBoer. Many, many years ago, for those of you that are of that same age, will remember that Anita came to our province many times. And one of the key things I remember Anita saying is that collaboration is not giving advice. Because <laughs> it's not. Clearly, that as that support person outside the class in person, whomever I might be, my role is not to give advice. My role is these sorts of things. My role is to listen. My role is to facilitate. My role is to follow that person's lead. In my head, I may think that that is the worst strategy on the face of the earth and it's never going to work. But you know what? Because the teacher owns it, chances are it will work. And if it doesn't work, then we can talk about that part. 
But if I start getting into the role of giving advice around that, or when I did, or I tried that in, then no. Then that doesn't develop trust. So how am I working on developing that trust relationship? So obviously, professional collaboration has to be interactive and ongoing. I don't start at the level I want to end on September the 6th. I might start on September the 6th as the resource person by saying, would you be okay if this year if I came into your classroom a couple of times and we? I might start as the classroom teacher by saying, I was away for two days in Richmond and these people talked about, would you be okay about coming into my classroom and helping me mental model the reading process? There's lots of ways to begin that process. The only thing that stops it is us in taking that step and that risk. Mutually agreed upon challenges. There's the conversation again. And what Faye and I and Lisa, Lisa. Right, are going to model is a process that you might want to take to build that what are our mutually agreed upon challenges and what are we going to work on for a short time period or a long time period. Capitalizes on different expertise, obviously. We all bring different knowledge, different backgrounds, different training from different training institutions, all those sorts of things. What a rich professional development opportunity to work with someone else and share that knowledge across and between us. Obviously, the roles become blurred. The kids no longer know who's who anymore. You're just a teacher as that resource person. You're not that person who takes those kids who have trouble down the hallway all the time. So let me reiterate what Faye said. Where the kids live is in that classroom. And I've had too many experiences in my life of being a resource person where they do really well down the hallway in the resource room. But what we know from every bit of research that's been done is that kids who struggle don't generalize. So they may be able to do it down there, and you may be excited to the roots of your souls about how well they're doing with you, and then they go back into their classroom and they don't generalize that information back to their classroom. No matter how hard you work, no matter what you do, what we do know is that the generalization will happen when it's in the context of the classroom. Because that's their context. That's where they live all day, every day. So, our rationale is by sharing our collective knowledge about our classes of students and developing a plan of action based on this, we can better meet the needs of all students. And that that intervention is focused on classroom-based support. Wrapped into the classroom, part of the classroom, where those children